This episode contains discussions of weight loss methods and diet culture, as well as brief mentions of child abuse. Listener discretion is advised. A self-described dumb blonde with a genuine heart of gold, this registered dietitian combined her love of the Lord with the professional training to craft her lightning rod hit weight loss program. But what started as a health venture morphed into a strict religious sect that concerned religious scholars and controlled its members' everyday behaviors, sometimes with deadly consequences. This week's episode is Gwen Shamblin Laura and the Way Down Diet, Part 1. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? Uh, well, we're in Texas, the land of the televangelists, and um, I... Uh... We should get our license plates changed to say that <laughs> instead of the Lone Star State. <laughs> um, actually, when coming back from the airport this weekend, passed by the... Is it TBN where they have the yes. exact replica of the White House? Of, I pass like... by it every time I drive to my mom's house. In It's like Washington, D.C. style miniature White yep. House. It's exactly yeah. that, yeah. People, like, don't believe us. Um, but I got to watch in... Uh... <laughs> The Farting Preacher. Did you ever watch those videos on E-Bombs World back in the day? No. And it's Robert Tilton. <laughs> and he's <laughs> he's just like, I can, I just can, I feel it. I feel it. Oh, and then it's just you know what? I think I have seen those. Of yeah. course. He's yeah. always wearing like kind of a gold jacket. I just got so tickled watching The Farting Preacher. You know, I pulled it up and thought, I'm, I'm beyond this. I'm more, uh, you know, I'm more respectable i have a higher brow taste in comedy and boy i was <laughs> doubled over it's so funny you know what starts, farts like, are always funny no matter how old always. you are and it's like <laughs> and he's like i can smell the lord is bacon bread and i can <laughs> oh there it is i can smell it <laughs> it's great <laughs> it's just so perfect it's almost as if he knew they were gonna add the fart noises yes in, but yeah uh so yeah we have a, and then there's that other um it's on the i think it's in the found footage festival which is one of my favorite weird comedy things where they had found footage of a guy named Jonathan Bell who was a TV preacher but he wasn't really a preacher he's wearing he's wearing a tuxedo oh yeah he's it was on um like cable access and he's yelling different things and he says at one point he says the satanists are making freaking candles out of freaking babies <laughs> and he's it none of it ma- <laughs> none of it makes any sense what um, I, yeah, and I don't think there was an audience, which is more eerie, I think. <laughs> just yelling this to an empty just, auditorium? <laughs> he's in a tuxedo alone, <laughs> making VHS tapes. So, man, he's another one. And I want to say he was also out of Texas. So we We're got right oh. with him. Also, the Steve Martin movie was made oh, in yeah. Texas. Oh, my what? gosh. Fun fact. Filmed here. And my godparents, my godfather was a teamster, worked on that movie, Leap of oh, Faith. Oh, yeah, Leap of Faith. That's it. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's uh, and there's a new Tammy Faye Baker um, movie coming out. We'll have to wow. cover their story. That's like a but it's got Jessica Chastain and Andrew Garfield in it. That's coming out oh, soon nice. about the fraud that they perpetuated. So this was uh, this was a listener suggestion. So and it, it, again, and we're in Texas. So dovetails in with what? Yes. What thank you, Becky about? Malloy, for this suggestion. That's the thing with these types of. Is she a preacher? Minister, I don't know. She's something. Mm -hmm. It's, I've never heard of one of these ending where it's not a scam. You know, that's the problem is that um, even, and it's one of those too, because a lot of this, I was reading an essay by someone who was studying kind of the prosperity gospel churches and the way that you kind of manipulate people who I think have a reasonable set of beliefs Mm -hmm. and you manipulate them into thinking that you as the leader need a $17 million jet or a $10 million house or $3,000 suits. The guy in the freaking $3,000 suit. You <laughs> it's know, the Righteous it's that... Gemstones, which, by uh-huh. the way, if you haven't seen, please add that to your list of TV I shows. I have to. It's so good. I love Danny McBride. He's so great in it. He's it. great in it. John Goodman's you're right, great you're in right. it, too. When you start mixing money, and then I think then it starts to become 
the loyalty, right? Like, okay, well, my loyalty is not bringing people to the Lord or saving people's souls. It's, I would like one more mink coat, please. So could you guys please send in? You know what I mean? So it's like, at what point are you preying on somebody's insecurities, preying on somebody's Well, she started off preying on people's insecurities and vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. That's what's so extra disgusting about this one is that she took what people are struggling with and what our society has deemed is ugly and inappropriate, and that's being overweight, and she used that to tr- lure people in and mm-hmm. give them this sense of, I can help you get all of this weight off. I can save all your problems. You don't have to be embarrassed. You don't have to be shamed anymore. Instead of teaching Love yourself for who you are. Love others for who you are. She positioned this diet culture and fat shaming with people's religious beliefs, which then turns into this extra fucked up thing. Oh, for sure. I mean, whenever you take a inherent trait in a person and then equate it with a moral failing, I mean, it's that's despicable. Oh, it's yeah. diabolical. Because I mean, then you're like... Oh, well, I failed because I'm not good enough for God. I didn't Mm -hmm. pray hard enough. That's why I ate that candy bar. It's just, I mean, it's a total mind fuck. Yeah, I called my one of my more religious friends whose father was a preacher forever and who still goes to church and real religious. And I said, hey, what would what would you say if I told you and I kind of described what this was? I said, what what type of church would you describe that as? I described kind of the belief system. And he goes, oh, that sounds like a cult. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay, thanks. Yep. Bye. (laughs) He was like, no, because any, you know, uh, the purpose of a church is like, hey, our doors are open. We're here for you. And if this doesn't work out, we want you to find God somewhere. Best of luck. But when you have a place that's like, I am your only I'm the only way for you to find God. I'm the only way for you to find salvation. You've just totally manipulated the scripture and like, nope, that's mm -mm, nope. That becomes a cult of personality. And not only I'm not, I'm the only way for you to find God. I'm the only way for you to lose weight and keep off the weight that you've Mm -hmm. been struggling to lose for so long. So you're, it's just like these two diabolical things that she's preying on that she's, Mm -hmm. She's a monster. And when it's, my, and it's I don't totally, think it's a hot take, but perhaps <laughs> no, it is, I don't think so. it's my it's my hot take. And it absolutely is a it's like a system. She set up a system of fat phobia to say mm-hmm. this is inherently bad. This trait is bad and it is a moral failing. And the only way that you can fix it is through m- m- this book and this class you can pay one hundred dollars. Yes. To go to. Yep. Well, if you're wondering who we're already all riled up about, it's uh, Gwen Shamblin Laura. For up until 2018, she was just Gwen Shamblin. So we're going to be calling her that in in this episode. It's a two-parter. So this is one of those episodes where my YouTube um, search oh history is now just annihilated. I mean, it's YouTube now is like, did you want to watch some more of these videos? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, please stop. Make it please end. But please also... stop. But also, yes, because the they're of. so unbelievable. The yeah. surrealness of these videos that we'll kind of talk about. And let's just go ahead and talk about this real quick. Heads up. Yeah. Give you a heads up. Speaking of heads. Yeah. Her hair. It w- it went on a journey from the nineteen late 1980s until... This year, I, I am, I understand quantum physics more than I do what the fuck happened with her hair. Yeah. It's a, it's a, so people that I, again, I try kind of, ta- I, I like to have a, a cadre of experts that I'll call on for random things or just friends be like, Hey, this is what we're doing this week. And just kind of, you know, pick people's brains. And I was sending photos of her without the warning. Her hair is maybe like a foot off of her head. And I'm not exaggerating. No, Uh, not at all. But the thing is, is it didn't start that way. Because you watch these interviews from like the mid-1990s. And it kind of looked like a, you know, you know, uh, what you would say. Like like a Southern Belle bouffant. A little bit. It it wasn't. Teased. It wasn't outrageous. Probably like three inches off her head. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just yeah. some volume, some 90s, late 80s, early yes. 90s volume, nothing wild. And then it just it took a turn. It I don't looks know like what happened. It looks like birds are living in there. 
It's humongous. It's really it's unsettling when you look at the photos. It really and is. Also, and so to me too is I would say as a person who's surrounded by what I think people who who love me and not people who <laughs> worship me and will just if I did something wacky they'd say what you know you would say hey hey what's going on I would say you, Heather what have you done to your hair what have you done to your what hair like happening? are you okay yes. like what's happening I would you wouldn't be just be like yes you. madam whatever you say prophet <laughs> I, I just captain. wouldn't address it what whatsoever so on the one hand, while I think it is, you know, it's something that, you know, I don't love ad hominem attacks, but this is a monstrous person who did for years make people feel terrible about several shortcomings that have physiological reasoning and have nothing to do with moral failing. So, you know, I hate that. But the hair, I think, is actually just a piece of evidence that she was surrounded by people who completely followed her, had no comment, mm-hmm. you know, like couldn't argue because you just let somebody do that and don't say, hey, is there, are, can you get through a doorway? Like, are you okay? <laughs> but what I don't get is how do you look in the mirror and think, nailed it. This looks great. Like, I mean, it looks as if she had her head sticking out of a, a car going 100 miles an hour. Yeah, it's, I don't even know. Honestly, I'm not a hairstylist. So if anybody is a professional hairstylist, let me know how you'd even get it that way. If it, unless it's like, I think some it's type a wig, of, like a piece, a hair piece mm-hmm. or a wig or something. Because what it would point to to me would be a person that's super thin, who's obsessed with thinness, who's obsessed with image thinness. Is it some type of a, body dysmorphia you know where you think my hair has to get bigger it has to be bigger and it's like an irrational chasing of some beauty standard ideal of beauty of like i have to have big blonde hair i have to be as thin as possible there's like her language with the hours and hours of interviews i watched of her her language always centers around this word thin and it's Mm -hmm. this thin ideal and it's not health it's not Carrying, you know, like you said, self acceptance, whatever. It's this thin, 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 thin. Yes. You want to be a thin eater. You want to be a thin. And so I wonder if that obsession with thinness, there was also some other beauty obsession, you know, some standard of beauty that she was trying to achieve that nothing's ever going to be enough instead yeah. of addressing that underlying issue that you have of like, why do I have to have higher, higher, higher hair? Um, just keep on piling on the Aquanet, you know? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. It's, and I told you too. One thing that is can be common with those that are suffering from uh, malnutrition is hair loss. So True. if she had lost a lot of her hair, then maybe she was overcompensating by wearing this this huge wig. But it's it's so unusual that mm-hmm. it's hard to get past mm-hmm. when you look at her. So if I had heard about this woman and was like, oh, I'd like to check out what this weight loss program is all about. And then I saw the website and that's who was talking to me. I wouldn't be able to get past the hair. Just like we talked about in the last episode, if someone got hard nips on stage during an improv show, you can't yeah. see anything else. That's all you can focus on. Does, isn't, we talked about it on the Patreon, right? Oh, was it on the Patreon? It was on the Patreon. <laughs> yeah, we had Judge was, Christie. Yes. Judge Christie ruled on someone getting fired for their nipples. So, um, <laughs> and, and not a sex working business, actually. No. So, uh, tune into Patreon for that. But yeah, no, you're right. It's something that is so distracting. And I, like I said, our, I think humans are naturally inclined to point out something that is, you know, atypical and notice it or whatever. And so, I think, you know, the schoolgirl bully in all of us is like, oh, man, look at her hair. It's so silly. But I think when you take a minute and go, but why, though? And it's is it because, again, there's an obsession with a beauty ideal that you can never, ever, ever achieve. And so you're just going to keep going higher. Is it something to do with malnutrition? Something or and then also does that then just serve as evidence that the people around you are just following you without question? And maybe she just liked it. Also that too, you know, I mean, all right, you know, to each their own, maybe she thought it looked really good. So if she, if it makes you confident, then if if it makes your hair as high as you need, you feel good and you don't ever want to wear a baseball hat, then go for it. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Gwen Shamblin was born on February 18th, 1955 in Memphis, Tennessee. She was raised in the Church of Christ by her mother and her father, a surgeon. According to the Way Down website, 
Gwen battled with her weight in her teenage years while attending Central High School. After graduation, she attended the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where she received her bachelor's in dietetics. While in college, Gwen continued to struggle with her weight, specifically being unable to lose 20 pounds that she had gained. In January of 1978, she married David Shamblin, an accountant. The couple later had two children together, Michael and Elizabeth. Furthering her education, Shamblin obtained her master's degree in food and nutrition at Memphis State, going on to teach classes at the college in food and nutrition. It was during this time that she became convinced that things like genetics, metabolism, and behavior modifications didn't explain why some people were naturally thin while others were overweight, according to the Way Down website. When she was in college, Gwen's love for God and her sudden 20-pound weight gain and her academic knowledge collided. Inspiring her to start her weight loss program, The Way Down, in 1986. And that's W-E-I-G-H, Way yes, Down. Yes, it's a play on words. And on an interview with Larry King, he asks how she names it. And she says her husband named it. And it was, she says, well, it, we shouldn't have really named it that because it's confusing and nobody knows how to spell it. But it's a play on words and blah, blah, blah. We all, if you see it, I think we all understand it's a, it's a play on words. She also, as we'll see, that's the only time I've ever heard her mention her husband. It's it like he's been erased because she's she remarried, yeah. and then it was as if the first one never existed. I saw it was a it was a unsourced former member said, "Oh, it was really looked down upon to get divorced," and then. Uh, so uh, so maybe she didn't mention him anymore because that would. Be admitting that she had got divorced. Yeah, that you got divorced. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. The core philosophy of the Way Down program is that people have two needs food needs and emotional needs. Shamblin believed and taught that you should only eat once you feel physical hunger, your stomach actually growling, and to stop eating once you feel full. In times where you want to reach for food and are not experiencing physical hunger, you should reach for the Bible instead thereby strengthening your relationship with God. Boy, if you try to take a bite out of the Bible, that's going to cause yeah. a lot of fiber, probably too much fiber. Pro yeah, it's hard to get through that leather. And then the pages are thinner, so that might be easier. But yeah, um, this is where you really start to see this twisted combination of faith and weight loss Mm -hmm. coming together and this there were other faith-based weight loss programs going on at the time she kind of credits hers as being the first one and perhaps it was but this is kind of when that trend started to really take off well and if there's two ways to make money you know being a televangelist or selling you know diet culture products boy you probably make twice as much money if you combine the two that's a good She's point like, why hasn't anyone thought of this mm -hmm. before on the website WayDown.com, those that subscribe to her methods are promised they will learn how to conquer overeating, how to eat regular foods and lose weight fast, how to overcome emotional overeating, how to stop binging, and how to transfer a relationship with food over to God. Speaking in the orientation video, Shamblin calls her program the pioneer of faith-based weight loss, assures viewers it is medically sound, and says followers will learn how to eat and think like a thin eater. The thin eater part really triggers me. And I think one reason I'm so riled up already about this topic, if you haven't mm -hmm. noticed, is I got real riled up last night finishing the outline and just reading and researching specifically about when we get into the program that she developed for children. Mm -hmm. As someone who has struggled with disordered eating since I can remember, same eight years old, probably to this mm -hmm. day, to and struggled also with eating disorders in high school and college. Mm -hmm. It is so upsetting to think that people that are already feeling perhaps bad about themselves, shameful, embarrassed, when that's 
because of what society and the media has perpetuated as this ideal, unattainable beauty standard that we almost have to be accepted in life, Mm -hmm. for someone to prey on that and not bring health into it at all. It's Mm -hmm. in, In fact, she specifically says, you can eat french fries and brownies and and chicken wings you just have to eat small little just you know 10 bites of food and don't exercise it like promoted anti-exercising it's not at all Mm -hmm. healthy it's specifically Mm -hmm. about being thinner and like you said she constantly reiterates this thin eater and she says i wanted to know why, why i couldn't lose this weight so i I contacted my skinniest friend and I said, can I just spend time with you and watch how you eat? And I went to McDonald's and I was eating my burger and my shake and my fries and I was sipping on my Coke afterwards and she had only touched half her burger and I Mm -hmm. wanted that other half of that burger. And I said, how do you not want to eat that? You know, and it's just, it's so icky. It does not come up from a place of wanting people to be healthy or feel good about themselves. I guess Mm -hmm. feel good about themselves in the sense that they are meeting this beauty standard that society has perpetuated, but not getting healthier. And like, and that's the reason that we're trying to lose weight and eat better. No, for sure. And I think one same, I mean, I've also had disordered eating my whole entire life and High school, college, same, had different eating disorders, and we talked about it on the show and everything. So I'm I'm always happy to discuss. And if you're struggling, DM me. I'd love to talk to you. But I'm not an expert, but I've been there. So and same. Yeah. And, and you know, it's it, – I do get – I also was riled up. And, I, I mean, this is – this one was, you know, I, I feel like we put in a lot of research for the show. But this is one that above and beyond – like, I sent you all my notes, and I was still watching videos mm-hmm. of her. And I couldn't – and so then I started reading books because I did start to feel a little bit triggered by this. And, yeah. You know, you hate to use that word. But, you know, I started thinking, okay, well, maybe I should just, like, wait until I'm absolutely starving. And then, you know, even – those thoughts start to creep back in, even at the thought of this. And that's why we put, like, a content heads up at the beginning because – you know, me studying this, so I, I got this book called You Have the Right to Remain Fat by this feminist author called Virgie Tovar that I started listening to in kind of to counteract this. And it really was kind of revolutionary in my eyes of all the things we kind of know. But the idea that you are the why why do you want to be thin? Right. Mm-hmm. Because thinness equals sexiness equals somebody wants to have sex with me like the heteronormative male gaze then I'll be desirable and so it's like when you really break down of like it's again it's not well I'm teaching you self-love because Jesus loves you just as you are and you just want to care for your body and nourish it with nourishing things it's like just eat a little bite of the hamburger and then you'll be thin and then somebody will want to fuck you and and if you're still hungry then just read the bible Read the Bible, like the natural extension of like, why? Why do you want to be thin? Mm-hmm. It doesn't say, you don't say we don't, you want to be healthy. It doesn't say you want to take care of yourself. What is this obsession with this thinness of, of it being an ideal? And it's like, my, my therapist says, some things are not good or bad. They just are. And it's like, your body just is, and you do want to be intuitive and take care of it. But this whole thing, and that's kind of the difference in a health system or a health plan and program of, you know, the National Eating Disorder Association has on their website, like intuitive eating, things that being thoughtful about yourself and being kind to yourself and not assigning good and bad labels to foods. This is all naughty foods. Like she talks, I mean, this fits the absolute definition of a diet in a diet culture. And she tries Mm -hmm. to say, oh, no, it's a lifestyle. But when you break down the components of it and you break down the, and again, you take the purpose or the goal which is thinness to its natural extreme of like why do i fucking care about being thin oh so somebody wants to fuck me right you know anyway yeah and when you bring god into it it's this i mean she straight up says overeating is a sin if you're an overeater you are a sinner god greedy yes you're greedy god will not accept you unless you lose weight you will be condemned i mean that is horrific for someone that is, mm-hmm. you know, that's their faith to to think and believe that if they don't obtain this perfection and then mm-hmm. how, what, when it is, when is it enough? And that's mm-hmm. how, I mean, all eating disorders are like, when is it enough? Like you're never thin enough. You've never thrown up enough, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, so she, she tries to claim 
she's helping people with eating disorders and that she worked with people with eating disorders. You are creating what an eating disorder is. Yeah. Yeah. Disordered eating. And it isn't listening to your body, right? It's like, I want to go, I got to go read the Bible instead. Mm -hmm. And then, and it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. In the beginning, Gwen spread her message through audio tapes she sold and small classes she taught at a store at the local mall. An article in Woman's Day reported that she would tell the small groups that attended that while you may want to be angry with God and blame him for your obesity, this isn't fair, saying, This is not a God who puts bacon and chocolate on earth to torture us. This is a sharp and loving God, the genius who created lasagna. The trick is not to be enslaved by food. If we behold or adore food, we will become like a refrigerator. If we instead behold and adore Christ, we will become like Christ. She, I will say, uh, throws around the word slavery oh. and enslavement way more than I'm comfortable with yes. a white lady doing. Talking yeah. about, yeah, it's a lot. It, it's, yes, and like it's nothing. It just rolls off the tongue. I will say, if you haven't tried God's lasagna, check out the <laughs> recipe. It's it's top notch, best lasagna I've ever had. There's but again, a it's... why Garfield loved it. <laughs> <laughs> He's more religious than we ever gave him credit yes. for. Yes, but she, again, it's this: if you if you want to become Christ like, then you mm -hmm. better drop some weight, and you better yeah. give up this thing that you know this this greed and this obsession you have, and she starts to make it not even about food. It starts to become about drugs, alcohol, pornography, all the things she deems. Depression. Yes, yes. And then mental illness. So it's it's a lot. It the, Speaking of greed, it's almost as if hmm. staying in your lane as a dietitian wasn't enough for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. By 1992, several churches had caught wind of the Way Down program and asked Shamblin to host seminars for their members. Within a few years, more than 5,000 Protestant, Catholic, and Evangelical churches were asking Shamblin to share her practices with their congregations. Her new edition of classes, called The Exodus Out of Egypt, were then shared with thousands. Following this surge in interest, she turned her teachings into a book, The Way Down Diet, which was published by Doubleday, sold millions of copies, and became a New York Times bestseller. So another thing that's really upsetting, and I mean, this continues to be upsetting to this day, is that so many people bought into this mm -hmm. because they wanted to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Instead of being happy with themselves, they were turning to anything to, to be skinny. And again, like you said, like, for what reason? Perhaps some of it is health, but I bet a lot of it is because that's how clothes are made. That's yes, what society. You, yeah, that's that phobia what you, in society. That's what you see on magazines. That's what you see on TV. You've been told that you're never going to get a significant other if you you know look the way you do. Mm -hmm. So it's just gross that so many churches. And then just people, enough to where she got on the New York Times bestseller for this book. Mm -hmm. That's what how big the diet culture was and still is. I don't think it's as bad as it was then. But, mm -hmm. you know, in the early 90s, this was uh, this was everywhere. Yeah, and I think we've luckily as a society become more educated and at least have gotten the language and been able to grasp concepts of, yeah, we live in a society that's not made for people over a certain size and do we want to live in a society at all that says you're not good enough you don't fit you're not part of this no i i sure don't no, i sure don't me either. and i don't want uh you know especially somebody who's going to church thinking this is going to be the answer and i would love to be able to find a community where i'm loved and accepted mm -hmm. for who i am and your preacher goes well we got a thing for you guys to stop being fat and it's like i thought i was okay oh, god loved me as i was yeah. like wait a minute I thought I was, you know, fine as I am. And it's like, no, it turns out you're not. You have to pay $100 a week to come hear this lady tell you about um, how you're greedy. Yeah, I thought that was kind of God's whole thing is that he loved all his children and yeah. they were created in his image and everyone was created equal and, and loved. 
But she has put this spin on it that nah, not if you're not if you're a fatty. No, pretty much, and, and or and other things, and and you know what? He would love you if you're fat, only if you try to get rid of that and fundamentally right. change who you are. Yes, yes. And then and then it's like, what if, and what if you just can't lose weight? What if they're you know? I mean, some people mm-hmm. that is just their body, and that's and also, fine. Be, that's if you're healthy. Well, who cares how yes, much you weigh? Exactly. And, and did you know? I learned from this book. Uh, that you that uh, people who are uh, over a certain size that you know society deems you know ba- basically you become othered right mm-hmm. over a certain size where clothes that you want to buy aren't in stores or whatever that the physiological impact of being othered is the same thing that happens to people in other marginalized groups that it causes high blood pressure anxiety heart problems so the irony is almost like the Britney Spears conservatorship like you're in the conservatorship that makes you feel terrible and then they say well you're so terrible that you need to be in the Mm -hmm. conservatorship it's like you're overweight so you get othered so then you have these physiological problems and then someone says well that's just because you're overweight that's because you know there's there's a story that in the book where a woman had a uterine tumor and she was she was overweight and she had all these symptoms and the doctor said all these symptoms would be cured if you just lost weight you would just feel better and you'd all the symptoms your period issues that you're having the nausea not being able to get out of bed all that would just be solved if you lost weight and she went to another doctor and they're like oh there's a big fucking tumor in your uterus did that not, last guy not test for that and she's like no he told me i was fat they're like that doesn't have to, anything to do with what's going on here yeah so it's like if you're you need to be you know we like i said we don't want to live in a society where you other people and you say oh if you're above a certain size we don't think you deserve any of these things you, you don't deserve medical care that's here to figure out the root problem of your issues and not just automatically go oh it's because you're fat you or know like you said just, that you have to have a special store for their yes. clothes or you have to pay more because your clothes are bigger, which yeah. I'll, th- that's one thing on our uh, website on for our merch is from the beginning, we're like, it doesn't matter if you're buying an extra small or a double XL, your Quadruple shirt's the XL. same price. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, even though, does it, do we get less from it? Yeah. But I, we don't give a shit. You should, as someone who has been in that position where I've had to pay more for the size clothes... What a shitty feeling mm-hmm. to be like, well, they had to use more fabric to wrap it around my fat ass. So I'm having to to pay a markup for that. Yeah. And we shouldn't. Like I said, I personally don't want to live in a society where anybody feels othered, mm-hmm. especially for something that I, they know. Like I know. I know I'm bigger. I know I can't fit in certain things, whatever. It doesn't help to have your own church tell you, no. anyway, we noticed that you probably might be one of the people that need this program versus, hey, you're welcome here. Yeah. When, yeah, and people that are struggling with those types of feelings, church might be the, the place that they look to for acceptance Community. and guidance and feeling loved. And then you instead are just shamed even further. Mm-hmm. And there's also studies that psychologically people who are over a certain size tend to do, to be more deferential. They have a looser boundaries that especially women are taught, well, you don't deserve love. So you have to do extra. You have to do more heavy lifting, whether it's in the bedroom or in relationships. And so if you have already you have boundary issues because you've you're, you've been feeling this way and because we live in a society that tells you you're not good enough until then you're at going to a church and they're telling you, oh, you got to be part of this. You're like, well, I guess I should. Otherwise, I'm the only big person that's not in yeah. it. You know, then you're basically being forced to do something you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Videos of members attending the seminars began to surface on the Way Down website and on YouTube. Shamblin would preach to those in attendance that God wants you to end your enslavement to the food and be slaves to righteousness. Those that had lost weight on the program would be paraded on stage to announce to the room how many pounds they had dropped. Words scrolled across the screen, reading, Everyone on this stage has lost over 100 pounds. Women held up pants of the size they once wore, next to their now thinner bodies. With every testimonial, the crowd burst into applause while Shamblin hugged and praised the member. Definitely sets a line between befores and afters. For sure, and it's this... Oh, I'm gonna get a hug or or a beat feel accepted or the the leader's gonna tell me I did a good job, just like a, a kid in class. You want to please the teacher, mm-hmm. so you're doing whatever you can to like get that moment of acceptance. You know, it also becomes a competition amongst members of the congregation. Like 
who can lose the most? Who's going to be the most popular, essentially, because I did the best at this? Again, it's never enough. Right. As Shamblin's popularity grew, she began to be featured in magazines like Good Housekeeping, Woman's Day, and Shape. Talk shows like The View, Tyra Banks, and Larry King Live were eager to interview her about her faith-based weight loss program. In her 1998 appearance on Larry King Live, Gwen told him that as a faculty member at Memphis State University, she worked with students who suffered from eating disorders. She also claimed that the Way Down Workshop class was then available in 28,000 locations. Gwen said before Way Down, she was 20 pounds overweight and constantly dieting. Because of this, she told Larry, I started looking at skinny people to see what their secret was. According to Nashville News 5, Gwen also told Larry she used history to come up with Way Down, saying, How in the Holocaust did you have all these people getting down real skinny? They ate less food. If everyone could see our faces right now. Well, this was one. So I had, I watched the Larry King interview with her. It is it's Her people, else. like her whatever, wherever she works, the Way Down company posted it. It's five parts. It's on YouTube. We'll yes. link in the show notes. I watched those five parts three times. And I do have ADHD, but I was waiting to hear this quote. This quote has been quoted on News Na- News 5 Nashville. Shout out again, local news. News 5 Nashville has covered her ass a lot because mm-hmm. she's in Brentwood, so it's just outside the area. And so I hope that's right. Uh, my 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 people are in East Tennessee, so um, we're <laughs> in the hill hills. Of my, my Tennessee hill people, we're on the East side. So, um, But Nashville News 5 quoted this, and several other people have quoted this Holocaust quote. But when I was watching the version that her company uploaded i couldn't find it oh well isn't that something yeah so it may like i said i i will always admit i have adhd and for you know a bird could have squawked outside the window and i'm at the right no moment i, I missed watched it. it too and also did not hear it okay well if you didn't hear it then that's that's all i needed to, <laughs> so I need to know i have <laughs> standard sonar bat ears that's the Y'all's, joke <laughs> i hear everything if it was in there you'd have heard it but that's why i'm like nashville Nine, five news and several other people have said she said that in the interview, but it just so happens the version that she uploaded doesn't include that quote. Isn't that funny? Also, this might be the most ignorant statement I've ever heard in my life. Oh, I'm sorry. Was Were we not taught properly in history class that the Holocaust was about weight loss? Oh, my Jesus It's obscene. Christ. Between calling everybody slaves and saying you want to be a slave to righteousness and then invoking the massive human suffering that occurred at these the hands of full monsters as a way for you to trick people into buying a book and join your cult it, it's beyond the pale it's yeah uh, it's i uh, i ha- <laughs> just like my i can't even get words out because it, my mind is mush thinking about how someone it would even think this, let alone say it on an interview with Larry King. I mean, it's fully, it just shows a detachment from reality. Yeah. That, and also a, the lack of seeing beyond yourself of not knowing anybody who was impacted by the Holocaust. Sure. To know that invoking that is incredibly incendiary. It's super painful. It's, I mean, this, this is like something a SNL sketch parody yeah. of a diet guru would as if say. those people were were choosing to lose weight and not eat in order to to get skinny as if that was a choice that anyone had not that they were in concentration camps and being starved to death it's just it's egregious and if she's saying it here you got to imagine she said it a lot of other times to mm-hmm. a lot of people in sermons and then, you know, if they're worshiping her and hang on her every word, they start to believe that. And that's how you just get this insidious, twisted reality that these people are living in. I, I just, yeah, I totally agree. And I also cannot imagine looking at a photograph mm. of people suffering in the Holocaust and thinking, wow, man, look how skinny they oh, are. I wonder Jesus. how they did it. That is the complete wrong message that you should be getting from you know yeah or the same of you like i said this it tells me all i need to know how often she invokes the word slave yeah it's it's i mean once is too much and she does it a lot yeah 
A video on the Way Down website describes other areas of people's lives that Shamblin has supposedly helped, including smoking, drinking, gambling, and other destructive behaviors. When the narrator mentions other destructive behaviors, a woman in the video is seen pouring pills into her hand from a large bottle labeled Prozac. During her interview with Larry King, Shamblin disagreed with the host that depression was a disease, saying, We've got too many people walking free and walking off of antidepressants after they have felt the joy. They got the joy back. She later conceded that there may be physiological reasons for depression, but that too many people are misdiagnosed and should try her program instead. I don't, for all his faults of Larry King, boy, he's actually, I mean, he was a good interviewer. I don't think that's a hot take. And he really went after her. Yeah. And he said, what are you going to say about people that are alcoholics? Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, I just think they could use the program. He's like, is this a joke? This is just alcoholism is a disease that's recognized. Mm -hmm. There's underlying factors. And what do you think about depression? And then she's like, no, there's too many happy people. He's like, are you telling me right now you don't think that depression and alcohol are actual medical conditions? And then she was kind of like oh, damn, I fucking stepped in it. And she's like, well, no, I mean, you know, it's just too much. It's just misdiagnoses. It's just, it, that's what it is. I mean, yeah. it's like, clearly you do believe that, you that, and that, that's extremely dangerous language to oh, say yes. mental health. Again, what you're doing is you're attributing a medical issue to a moral failing. You're equating mm -hmm. that, well, if you just love God more, you wouldn't need that Prozac. Yeah. Yeah. And Which is not true. No, God. As someone who is on uh, three anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications, I promise you that if all of a sudden I decided to give my life to the Lord, that is not going to matter. Like, my brain does not work the way it should work without, and it's, you know, I mean, and that's fine. And that's mm -hmm. for what a lot of people deal with. And so many of the members that were struggling with depression and anxiety and were on medication were shamed into literally they would watch while they flush them down the toilet. Yeah. You know, or, or tell, they would, their, tell their spouses when they're sleeping, go in there and take yes. all their, you know, their, yes. their medicine from How their psychiatrist. Dangerous is that. Mm -hmm. And then, and to the, where they would be taking them in secret just to feel better mm -hmm. because I'm sorry. And, and if you're religious and you don't agree with medication and you think praying is the way to do it, Okay, but if you're if you need medication in order to function and be happy, there is nothing wrong with that. If it's you have a medical condition or mental health problems and for someone to shame you for that and then mm -hmm. to take away your medication, that is abuse. Yeah. And the dangerous thing is it's not just her. She's got this doctor. Uh, that's actually a professor at Vanderbilt. You're like, oh, I can't God. believe he used to be a professor at Vanderbilt. I'm like, no, 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 he currently is. His and inner, he, he, when he speaks, I fall asleep. Could well, he be more boring? Fuck. But on top of that, he has, it, I think the danger comes from, she's not just some Yahoo saying all this stuff, that she can kind of hide behind, well, I have a master's in food and nutrition, yeah. so I know science. And same with, this guy's like a medical doctor. And... Uh, the chilling video of him talking about COVID-19 in early March is uh, more than more than one could stomach. But she has a medical doctor that appears. I mean, he must be a member of the church for how much sure. or, or at least just buys into it. Um, but he's on these videos as well. And so I think that the harm, like you said, people can believe whatever they want to believe and do whatever they think is right for them. But I think the harm comes when you are positioning yourself as an authority figure and saying, hello, I am an expert in weight and health and nutrition. By the way, if only if you want to stop smoking, all you have to do is grab the Bible um, and not understanding that there's physiological underlying reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Then that I think that's when it again, you're it's an abuse of power. Yeah. That you've gotten this platform and you've positioned yourself as an expert and you're now and, and especially the church stuff when we get down to that of causing active harm to people who have trusted you. Mm -hmm. On that Larry King interview. She just talks in circles. It's like listening to a politician. It's oh, al yeah. it's almost like you said an SNL bit, bit because mm -hmm. it's just Larry King will ask her the, a question and what a. Like you said, for all his faults, hell of an interviewer. Because he will cut people off mid-sentence if he thinks it's bullshit and just, like, mm -hmm. fire a question at him and, you know, keep them on their toes. And every response is just this 
huge smile. Well, it's just the Lord. You know, I mm-hmm. think it's really if we all love the Lord more and it's like you're not answering anything. Mm-hmm. You just yeah. keep saying the same word vomit over and over, which works on your congregation because you've brainwashed all of them and they're starving so they can't think straight. But to a person that isn't in that, you're just like, this is nonsense. I can't remember which cult we were talking about. Oh, it's Bentinho, Massaro, mm-hmm. where the cult expert said, if you type out what they're saying mm-hmm. and try to read it back, it sounds like when you're listening to it, it washes over you and you think, oh, that's there was a lot of buzzwords in there. That was a good answer. But when you type out what her answer is and try to read it back, you're like, oh, the, this is mush. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. One call-in viewer questioned Gwen's motives, insinuating that she was preying on people's vulnerabilities and exploiting God for profit. Gwen denied this accusation, admitting that, You've got to make money to go on. But assuring viewers that she does not take a salary, saying, Half the money goes to the government and we accept no donations. And that any money received is to keep the business going. So that someone else can be helped. To reiterate her point, she doubled down, telling Larry King, If you'd like to call this a scam, may there be more. The fruit of it is incredible. I just, I have no guilt about it at all. So she's saying on this interview that all of the money they get, half of it goes to the government for taxes, I guess. Which mathematically doesn't work (laughs) out, by the way. And then that the other half goes right back into the program so that, They can continue to fund the program and keep helping people. My question is, how does anybody, if that's the case, make a living? Yeah. Well, I I think that the if that's the case is the key word in that, that it's not the case. Yes. Yeah. I haven't looked at the books and records of this, but I'm going to call shenanigans. I don't think that that's an accurate portrayal. And again, the power that one has over a group of people to where no one questions that. Oh, yeah. When, I mean, it's simple math and and logic that you'd say, well, then how does she afford her mansion? How does she afford her private jet? How does she afford these clothes? Mm -hmm. If she's not taking a salary, where is any of her money coming from? That's a great question. Yeah. And there's no donations. She also kind of, I believe she says on Larry King, there's nothing magical in being a nonprofit. Well, I imagine her accountant husband told her that was not the case, given the financial decisions that they went on to make. Yes. Regarding her interview with Larry King, News Channel 5 spoke with Shamblin in 2001 and asked her to clarify her earnings, saying, Half and half leaves nothing for Gwen Shamblin. That's not completely true, is it? Shamblin replied, Yes, it's completely true. Many, however, believed this couldn't possibly be true, given the lavish lifestyle Shamblin led. Sinister Hood will be right back. I got away with uh, not shaving for the whole winter, but in the summer I was swimming this weekend in Philly and I had to uh, get my shave on just for my own. I just, I get itchy, my skin, I don't like Mm -hmm. it. So I just like to be slick like a little seal when I'm going in and out of the pool. (laughs) And I uh, can do that with my amazing, amazing Athena Club brazier. Yes, I don't like to sleep if um, I haven't shaved and my legs are touching because mm. it just, it's not comfy. So yeah. It's a sandpaper style. And now that it's hot and stuff and you got to sleep in shorts, you got to, you got to bust out the old razor. Shaving used to be something that I dreaded, but Athena Club's products make it more fun and easier to shave. It's not only the prettiest razor I've ever seen, but it's also gentle on my skin, leaving it moisturized, super smooth, like a baby seal and bump free. <laughs> <laughs> Athena Club's razor is designed with built-in skin guards to help prevent razor burn while being gentle on curves. I have stopped hacking on my own knee due to the Athena Club razor. I love it. It is Congrats. no wonder that their razors have thousands and thousands of five-star reviews. The razor blade is surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, which is a holy grail for skincare. The best part is a razor kit's only $9, and it comes with two blade heads, a magnetic hook for shower storage, which we both love, Mm -hmm. and your choice of handle cover. And the razor has cute little handle cover options, but they also have black and white razors if you're a minimalist. I personally have the navy blue razor. Oh, I have the rose gold. 
And it is the prettiest razor I've ever had. And like we've said, that little shower hook and the little it makes when you click it. Oh, it's so satisfying. Keeps it out of the hands of the kids. I love it. Plus, you'll never have to worry about running out of refills or being stuck with dull, overused razors, which is the worst. You can choose how often replacement blades ship to you for free. That means fresh, ready-to-use razors always arrive right when you need them. Athena Club also has the dreamiest shea foam that will leave your skin soft, hydrated, and smooth. Show your skin off with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Sign up today and you'll get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code SINISTER. That's A-T-H-E-N-A-C-L-U-B dot com with promo code SINISTER for 20% off. You know, Christy, they say adulting is bullshit. I agree. It's an onslaught of WTFs at least 20 times a day. But this subscription box will say everything you mean to say about life so your mouth doesn't have to. And I think we both have sass mouths. Oh, for sure. Smart Ass and Sass is a monthly subscription box that brings snark and sass right to your door. Heather... A targeted ad was because <laughs> what what describes me better than smart ass and sass? I saw a targeted ad for this and I said, we have got to advertise this to our listeners <laughs> because this is so up their alley. And then when we got our boxes, literally, I loved everything, everything in it. I got this awesome tote with a Schitt's Creek quote on it. Oh, yeah. I'm done with waking hours for the day. I got a Mean <laughs> Girls, like, beach bag that's, that's pink and says, you're really pretty. Like, they're <laughs> every, I got Golden Girls pins. There's, um, it's just everything, everything I love in one little box. I already started using mine. I got a, it's kind of a canvas bag that could be a makeup bag. I use it to put all my plugs in it when I was traveling. And it says, you should see my active bitching face. <laughs> Um, and a tote bag that says, um, inhale the good shit, exhale the bullshit, mm-hmm. as well as a coffee mug, which are my faves. I have so many coffee mugs. And then um, a little notepad. It's little um, post-it notes that say, don't half-ass. Um, and there's a little Sharpie marker, too, that I've been leaving Paris lovely notes on the don't half-ass um, <laughs> post-it notes. I, I love it so much. Smart House and Sass items are curated and tested by the SNS team, a group of really mouthy mofos who cannot stop laughing at their own dang senses of humor. You can choose from three levels of subscription. T-shirt only, which you get one T-shirt a month, a box only, which is six to nine smart ass items, and the best deal of all, the big box, which is the shirt and all the items. You can subscribe at smartassandsass.com and use code CREEPY for 25% off your first subscription box, and all boxes ship on the 18th of each month. You can follow Smart Ass and Sass on social media for your daily dose of attitude, updates on special sales, and product highlights from the shop. Following the success of her book, Shamblin founded the Remnant Fellowship Church in 1999, combining her for-profit weight loss system with a tax-exempt religious organization. What started as a meetup of a few people in her home quickly grew to more than 1,500 members in 150 congregations around the world, according to the Tennessean. In 2000, however, thousands of participants deserted Gwen's program after her controversial statements on the Christian concept of the Trinity. In an email to over 40,000 people, Gwen disavowed the Christian Trinity, stating that she did not believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all united in one Godhead. Hundreds of churches then rescinded their support for her program. Yeah, this was a big, uh, dramatic statement to make. It certainly was, yes. Um, I'm not, you know, I grew up raised Baptist and, you know, I'm interested always in different belief systems and everything like that, so... I was trying to look up because I'm not, a, I won't call myself a Christian scholar, um, but I was I asked Paris and I was asking some of my friends who are Catholic or, you know, just what does this exactly mean? And, you know, nobody really knows the exact how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all work together, but it's all one thing. And she said, oh, I don't believe in that. God is first. God is number one. Everything comes second. Um, also, I will say, let me let me just say, for all the shit we're talking, if you make millions of dollars off of a weight loss book, balling out of control the most baller move of all is to turn that shit into a church so it's tax exempt yeah yeah there was no um it was that accountant husband definitely said uh this is what we need to do Mm -hmm. he's like damn this these tax bills are out of control i would again i will reiterate the government did not take half i'm sure but 
it probably took a pretty big chunk, maybe 37% or something like that, but or more. But uh, yeah, you're if you take it and turn it into a church, come on now. Mm-hmm. Come on now. And one of her former uh, members who wrote a really long testimony about it kind of said, you know, this went on. She kind of com- she combined the way down company with this church like they started the lines start getting blurred and she said oh this is what i wanted all along Mm. don vino head of a chicago-based group that vets dangerous christian sext told cbn news that shamblin's views were more in line with mormons or jehovah's witnesses rather than traditional christianity theologians like dr vincent sinon a professor of divinity called her statement a form of ancient heresy called subordinationism, the belief that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are subordinate to God. When leaders of other churches asked her to recant her statement, according to the Wall Street Journal, Gwen refused, stating that she had only the purest of intentions and was simply teaching what she had learned from her father and the Church of Christ as a young girl. I'm not a savvy business person. I'm just a dumb blonde with a genuine heart for God who found the golden product that everyone wanted. So I am not Church of Christ, and I will not claim to be as uh, very knowledgeable, but from what I did read, this belief is held in the Mormon Church, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Church of Christ, that God is up top and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are subordinate. So if that's what you grow up believing, then, you know, that's fine. I think everyone's problem was they felt had. They yes. didn't know that she felt this way. And they felt like, as some people said, that she was one of us, which that in itself is a bit problematic. But that she, I guess, should have disclosed this or that it was so um, out of the norm that she was lying to them essentially by omission by not saying this up front when really from what I could tell, it's not like she ever said, Oh, I do think that. And then came out and said she didn't, she'd always thought that way. It just never came up until she decided to send a mass email to her 40,000 <laughs> people on her newsletter list on the email list. Yeah. I, I mean, again, not being a, a biblical scholar, I did not know how big of a deal it was to say, to make that statement of mm-hmm. that. I mean, it is a, branching off and the and the doctor sign in on the it was on christian broadcast network like cbn this interview with him and he said oh this entire new religions break off because of this this yeah. hot take it's such a hot take and so the the former member that wrote a big long description of his time in there said you know there is biblical proof of the godhead that all three are the same but and that's in the king james version but she rejects that version as false and unreliable and she thinks that the niv is the only version to to trust and that's kind of and her interpretation of the scriptures again are the right interpretation not well let's discuss what this might mean to us it's what i say is right yeah and i'm gonna send an email about it (laughs) meanwhile gwen was still running way down as a for-profit venture in 2001 four way down employees sued gwen for religious discrimination in their lawsuit the employees claimed that they were told never to question her teachings, and if they did not espouse her doctrinal beliefs, they should seek employment elsewhere, according to the Nashville Post. Still, thousands believed she could do no wrong and that her word was as good as gold. Ex-member Tim Smith recounts it on the morning of 9-11 as employees gathered around the television and watched the towers burning. Gwen told workers at Way Down, See? I told them something like this could happen. They wouldn't listen to my warnings. They wouldn't listen to me. Now look, America is an arrogant nation and God has brought his judgment down. And I told you all this could happen. After she left the room, a high-ranking church official told employees they had just witnessed a true prophet from God confirming her own prophecy. This is a big red flag. Yeah, If we're looking at uh, this as a cult and her as a cult leader. Yeah, that's kind of the big one of the big flags for this gentleman who if I I did not see him named in the lawsuit, but the implication from what he writes about about his work at Way Down that he said I'm legally not allowed to talk about it. Uh but that's kind of a, a light bulb moment for several people that they're watching 
you know, again, if you look at the Holocaust and your takeaway is, wow, look at how skinny all those people are. And then if you look at 9-11 and think, I called it, mm. nailed it, all about me, that is a skewed form of thinking uh, that I think shows kind of this dangerous becoming the head of something, having people not question you. And especially if one of your second in command comes by and tells the peons underneath, y'all just saw her dunk on America. Yeah. Take that. Take yeah. that, everybody. She's a true prophet. I also want to know who they are. I told oh, them so something I like this. They wouldn't listen to my warnings. Who is they? Well, she, I think she said a few months prior, according to Tim Smith, that a few months prior, there was a taping for her way down session and that she said America is a place that could possibly be attacked by a foreign country and that we shouldn't take anything for granted. And as Tim Smith said, that's um, literally what you hear on like the news from like yeah, national security it's pretty advisors. It's pretty broad. Yeah. Um, and so she decided that that was her 9-11 prophecy and that 9-11 was a fulfillment Despite the fact that prophets in the Bible or any type of, you know, a good psychic will tell you exactly what's going on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not just a vague sense of like something bad might happen. Um, but she took that previous taping of her saying that America is possibly vulnerable to being like, I told you that on September 11th, this exact thing would happen. Wow. I nailed it. I'm a prophet. In 2002, Shamblin purchased 40 acres of land in wealthy Brentwood, Tennessee, that she then donated to the church. Over the next two years, a 650-seat church inspired by the old first church in Bennington, Vermont, where Robert Frost is buried, was built. Its doors were opened in 2004. Two years later, she donated the entire Waydon organization to the church, according to the Remnant Fellowship website. So again, she uses what she uh, points out as a, as a point of pride and like, look how generous I am that she purchased with her own money this 40 acres of land that she then donated to the church. Well, guess what happens when you donate that to that church? Cha-ching. <laughs> Tax deduction. And guess what happens when you donate your entire company to the church? You're not paying taxes on any of that anymore. And then you look like a hero to these people who already are under your spell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then so you say any royalties that come from any way down participation then is going to be funneled through this tax deductible entity, uh, this tax free entity. And also, uh, yeah, this land. And and then I believe and I can check for part two that the IRS has a parsonage exemption. So if you're the leader of a church, then you get to exempt your personal residence, which is why you see. Oh, these church leaders with these enormous ass houses. I'll double Which check she it. Has. She oh, lives yeah. in a, I forgot, some mansion built in the 1800s. I mean, it's gigantic. Yeah, yeah I have the address. No, I looked at it. I, <laughs> I did the Google Street View of it. It's, mm -hmm. um, it is very nice. Yes, yes. And again, if you're not taking a salary, then somebody tell me how that works. Because I'd love that information for myself personally. I mean, right? No. And that, and I think that's just it is that, you know, if you see a jet that's registered to JNF Productions Limited LP and that's a subsidiary of the church, but then you're using the jet to fly around do whatever you want, at what point? I mean, that's the question we have with the First Amendment of like you can't establish what is and isn't a religion, but I think you could agree that that jet is not really being used for religious purposes, right? right. And however, the person flying the jet or owning the jet would spin it to make it look to their parishioners that all of this is God's will. And I have to go to Maui on mm -hmm. this month long vacation because the people of the island need me. And, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they spin anything and everyone just eats it up. When, if you own a business, so like, say we had the Sinisterhood jet and we <sighs> were in, <laughs> yeah. Um, when we, you know, and say we say, okay, well, we use it to fly to tour 
you know, spots or whatever. That's fine. That makes sense. You know, that's going to be part of that doesn't count as income. That's a business expense, whatever. But then we go and just want to fly around and I just want to fly back to Philadelphia and get another Schmitter sandwich, which I just had this weekend. Well, what that is then is income to me. Like the value of riding on that private jet is income to me. So the IRS can come back and say, hey, Heather, what did you and Christy use this jet for? And I'm like, we went to all these different cities for the tour and they go, okay, but what's this flight to Philadelphia? What'd you do while you were there? And I'm like, oh, damn, it was my sandwich flight. Well, then they say, okay, well, the value of that flight on that jet was this many dollars. Then we're going to tax that. That was income to you, right? That's a business. That's an income benefit that you got that you then need to pay taxes on. But when you're a church, it's like out the window. Mm -hmm. Members of the church are fiercely devoted, with hundreds uprooting their families to move closer to it. Many have pulled their children from schools and cut ties with family members that do not attend Remnant, according to an article in Self. Events are held nightly, including Bible studies, way-down classes, weddings, and a three-hour-long worship service every Saturday evening. Members typically live near one another, keep their circle of friends to those that attend the church, and only date and marry fellow members. The article that's written in Self is, and of course it'll be in the show notes, it's very interesting because the person went and tried this program a couple of mm -hmm. times. And so, you know, they were, I don't want to say undercover because part of it did work for them. And then they went back as, as we'll see, and it, it had changed quite a bit, but they said that, you know, uh, 700 people picked up their lives, moved across the country, kind of like we saw with, with love is one mm -hmm. left, left families or uprooted their families, cut off ties with people and would even live together in homes, like groups of families would live just so they could afford to be closer to her until they could get their own place. And then they all live in the same neighborhood, like next door to each other, like a commune, essentially. Mm -hmm. And and also, if you leave, then they tell you not to talk to them anymore, that your mm -hmm. Satan has gotten a hold of you and don't don't talk to him anymore. So this is when we start to see it go from a harmful, you know, diet culture program to a church that maybe are sort of doing it for tax purposes to take advantage to asserting control over various aspects of people's lives. Mm -hmm. So it's the this progression. Sinister Hood will be right back. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. You may not be feeling down and out and depressed or like you're even at a total loss. But if your stress is high, your temper is shorter than usual, or even if you're starting to feel strain in any of your relationships, you could probably use the chance to unload. When there are things you can't tell anyone or feel like you can't unload to family or friends, you need to unload it. And that's what therapy can be. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. I personally use BetterHelp, and I actually had something pop up today, and I thought, I really want to talk to my therapist about it. And I was texting back and forth with her and you know, made an appointment for a session uh, later on when we're both available. But it was nice to just have that connection that sh I knew she would respond and she would be there for me. That's great. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Sinisterhood listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Sinister. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Sinister. Shamblin has claimed her program is the only one of its kind. However, that is far from the truth, according to the New York Times. Many other faith-based weight loss programs exist, including Thin Within and PRISM and the Freedom Weight Loss Program. The one thing that does separate Way Down from the others is their program specifically targeted at children. E. The New York Times reported that in 2004, Shamblin began teaching The Last Exodus, a program designed to teach children as young as eight how to turn their problems away from food and towards God. The Way Down website states, Throughout this class, you will hear from teens and young adults who have exchanged a passion for things that rob them of looks time and money with a focus and love for God. As with her classes geared towards adults, the last Exodus promises to help children and teens overcome the pain, shame, and embarrassment of obesity. This breaks my heart. 
as a little fat kid who's now grown up into a fat adult is that, uh, <laughs> that which is fine. This is, I love myself, right? I, um, and I love you and I think you're beautiful. I think you're beautiful. Um, and I mean, I think those things can be true. I think a lot of times when somebody will go, I'm fat and someone's like, no, you're beautiful. And I'm like, no, no, I didn't say I was ugly. Right. Like, I am right. both fat and beautiful, That's but I do not, appreciate well, But I know, so I, I kind of just did that. I'm sorry. No, I know what you mean. <laughs> well, I know what you mean. I am beautiful. <laughs> like right now I'm wearing a uh, shirt or a, a dress where my arms are exposed, which is like my biggest mm-hmm. paranoia body point. And this weekend, my friend Elise said, I think your arms are fine. They're lovely. And I've been trying to tell myself, my arms are fine. They're lovely. It's summer. I'm allowed to have my They're arms great. out. I'm hot. Right. And Everyone's like, allowed to wear whatever the fuck they want. It is your body. Do with it. Wear what you want. You can see my armpits. Um, and so no, so but as a little former fat kid, um, that was told like, do we need to send you to fat camp? Do we need to, you know, what can we do to help you? And that comes from I think a good place, hopefully. But it is harmful to say. Oh, if you're fat, you're going to be shamed and embarrassed mm-hmm. and not address the issue of like the shitty little kids that are yeah. making fun of someone for being fat. Yes. Like not raising healthy, strong, kind people who say, hey, d- you know, you're going to break that swing, which a kid yelled at me or whatever. And instead of having saying like, oh, well, we need to train Heather to be less fat. How about you train the five kids around it who didn't say a goddamn thing to say, hey, you're an asshole. Don't say stuff like yes. that. And I think you do an excellent job. Ella is one of the kindest kids I've ever seen. I mean, she's so thoughtful and kind to others. And we were talking about this last night of like, you know, she's going to just be like a warrior for other people. She's going to stand up and be like, no, that's not right. Let's not do that. So to see that the training here is not like we're going to teach kids how to be more like Jesus, which is more accepting and loving and opening our arms. It's like we're going to teach kids that they're wrong for being fat Mm -hmm. and that they need to fix it. Otherwise, they're going to be sad and shamed and embarrassed. Yes. And I think it's completely twisted. Oh, and the guy, it's totally the former member. Up. Oh, it's totally fucked up. The former member said, too, like her view, the remnant fellowship view of God is one that God has conditional love, which is completely the antithesis of biblical scripture and teaching that, you know, the Bible uses words like enduring, endless, forever, grace. God has unlimited grace. Her thing was like, you have to do something to earn God's love. Yeah. And this something here that you're telling these kids is you have to change. Yeah. God doesn't I, love you as you are. I mean, to tell them that you've been robbed of your looks. Yeah. I, robbed oh my god yeah as if a child that is whatever if they're medically deemed overweight because i don't even like to say anybody is is fat or overweight because be the size you are if you're happy Mm -hmm. with yourself and you love yourself that's that's all that matters at the end of the day and kids are kids you know Mm -hmm. i mean it pains me to think that any child as young as eight or whatever is thinking about how they look and Mm -hmm. being embarrassed to go to school or to hang out with friends or or go to the playground because they think that they are fat and that other people are going to make fun of them. Instead of, like you said, teaching your asshole kid that is going to be the one to make fun of them, like to be kind and accepting, but Mm -hmm. also teaching the child that feels this way, to be confident in who they are and that they are mm-hmm. beautiful and that it's weight should not even be a thing you think. My wish for Ella, I'm like getting emotional thinking, Aww. is that she never has to think about her weight. Mm-hmm. Like that's not even a thing that crosses her mind because it was such something that was just like drilled into me in such like a presence in my life from mm-hmm. such a young age that... Mm-hmm. I mean, it's completely, not completely, but it's definitely shaped like who I am as an adult. And I still struggle with disordered eating beca- because of all of it. And I mm-hmm. never want Ella to look, at, to think, I can't wear this shirt because my arms are exposed. Because that is mm-hmm. a huge trigger for me, too. And I still have those thoughts. And so I have to make it like a huge point. And I, I actually do a really good job of it. And it was something I was worried about is not talking bad about myself in front of her. Mm -hmm. I used to, before I had children, I would talk so bad about myself. And I mean, Tommy would always be like, you're so hard on yourself. Like, you know, you're beautiful. I wish you could see what I see in you. Mm -hmm. And when I had her and I told myself, like, I do not want any of my issues to be projected onto her or for her to grow up having these thoughts. So, 
I just cut it off. And that's not to say I don't still have those thoughts and I don't still say those things to me when she's not around. But I, I honestly think if I was to say that person is really fat, she would go, what's fat? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I don't even think she would understand that because I really, both of us like don't use the, I don't like criticize the way I look. I don't say like, Oh, I shouldn't wear this because wow. Mommy looks really big in this or, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, so that is the way that I hope I can raise her to not only not be the kid that doesn't want to go to the playground because they're embarrassed of how they look, but also the kid that if they saw someone bullying another child for that that would step up and be like be kind what this Mm -hmm. is you know it doesn't matter what what are they like on the inside that's what we should really be worrying about and if we can start doing that with children instead of teaching them that you've been robbed of your looks time and money and you got to put down the candy bar and pick up a bible use that time and energy to teach them to be confident Make them all Lizzo's. We need Lizzo to come in to this <laughs> remnant church. fellowship church and just revamp the entire thing, because that's what we should be raising children that the generations like that. Not that we're continue to perpetuate this idea of what society thinks is beautiful and what we've been sh- had shoved on our throat for way too long. Well, I'll, I will me, now get off my soapbox. No, I love your soapbox because <laughs> you give me hope for the future. You and how my sister raised my niece and like telling like, she'll, you know, again, we are all programmed to point out anomalies, right? It's evolutionary of like, we're all part of the pack. It's safer or whatever. And when my, my niece will point something out that's different, my sister will always say, oh, different is beautiful. That's different. Mm-hmm. Isn't it cool how we all have different kinds of hair? We all have different yeah. color skin. Isn't it? Don't you notice how beautiful this that they look in the sun? Not like, oh, well, we're all, col- you know, I'm colorblind. Everybody's the same. It's like, no, isn't that great? Let's celebrate how beautiful that person's hair is. Let's celebrate how beautiful they look. Let's celebrate how beautiful that color is on them. And to say, you know, like, oh, they're wearing a bright emerald shirt like that's and they're a bigger person not say oh wow that's really big that's a really bold color for a person to wear yeah. it's like oh my gosh look how beautiful she is and they're like she she looks like in the sun she's glowing you know pointing out that something is not necessarily bad it's and that different is not bad it just it is the way things are and mm-hmm. to celebrate and appreciate that so I, I love that I have little tiny ones in my life that I know will grow up to make the world a better place that 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 is the thing we should be fighting right it's not like you're wrong and bad one little kid who's chubbier than everybody else it's those shitty kids that either a say the bullying things or b say nothing yeah and so that i think that's the framework we need to change yes and i and think all of doing that it. no yeah and i think that kind of message starts in the home mm-hmm. you know bullying or being kind like kids Kids aren't born with that stuff, you know? Well, like, that's exactly what you said. Like, like Elle, you said she wouldn't know to point and someone say that they're fat. That book that I was listening to, she said it's like a social construct, right? Mm-hmm. Of like, when you're a little kid, you jiggle and you love how you, you know, you shake your tummy and you're like, oh, it's my tummy. And you don't know, like, cover that up. That's fat. Yeah. Like, yeah. you don't know that that's become so bad. And hopefully we are now moving away from this 90s diet culture and more into and even uh, now you have like the health movement but a lot of times the health movement uh, really the end game of this health thing that they're pushing on you is thinness it's just so rebranded it's like, yeah yeah it's just rebranding it so i think just the kind just pushing kindness and self-acceptance mm-hmm. which i don't know is in the original bible if you look at it, you know? so yeah. it's like she almost she almost could have nailed it but it really was yeah, completely then misguided it, it went way off the rails though at the last minute yeah The program is run by Shamblin's adult children, Michael and Elizabeth, along with their spouses. Current pictures of Elizabeth show an incredibly thin woman with exposed collarbones and sunken cheeks. Though at one time, both Elizabeth and her brother were 35 pounds heavier. She told the New York Times, I think God let us be fat so we would have mercy for these children. Again, such a dangerous and problematic way of thinking. And I can't imagine uh, growing up in a house where your mother was obsessed with her looks, your looks, your weight was an Mm -hmm. easy thing to do. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're you're going to be subjected to that. And so it's no wonder you then go and perpetuate what she's already been doing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't excuse it. No, 
We should uh, all try to be better than where we came from. Ab- absolutely. But it definitely makes sense how you end up down that path. Yeah. Like adults that follow the Way Down program, children are also encouraged to give testimonials at meetings, announcing how much weight they have lost. According to the New York Times, when it was his turn to speak, 11-year-old Nicholas Zanoni said, We've only lost about 10 pounds, but if it wasn't for this message, I guarantee I would have eaten my way to a good-sized little kid. I'm working on losing more weight. It's all God, really. He'll tell me the weight he wants me to be. It's crushing. It's crushing that the kid's thinking about that, that he's not like, when I grow up, maybe I'll be a fireman or a Mm -hmm. dancer or an astronaut or a teacher. It's like... Oh, I'm fat, and so luckily I lost 10 pounds, but maybe I can lose more weight. That is not what the kids should be focusing no. on. Be happy, be healthy, go move, go play with your kids, go play with your friends, play pretend. Like, good go God, be a the kid. weight. The irony is the weight that you just put on those kids' shoulders oh. by putting that thought into their head. Yep, yep. Victoria Moran, author of Fit From Within, told the New York Times that she disagrees with Shamblin's approach. Interchange is absolutely essential for lasting change of any habits. What's tricky is when someone believes that their way is the only way. For example, Jesus helped me not eat today. Then the next day, today I had two candy bars. So who's at fault? Is Jesus not the Lord of my life or am I just this horrible, awful sinner? The kid will probably think the latter. And will the adults. Yeah, anybody. I mean, that's naturally what... The folks that have been in this um, and we'll go through more testimonials next time of like, I am a failure. I, I'm not one of God's children unless I am thin. And I think that is the separation. Again, when I call my, you know, my really religious friend and said, Hey, you know, what is it? What would, what would you tell me when someone said my interpretation is the only way my path is the only way. And he's like, that's a cult of personality. That's not a, that's absolutely not a congregation. Mm -hmm. He's like a congregation is you're welcome. We're here to help you. If you don't like it, you know, that's fine. Move on. We hope you find it somewhere else, but not if you leave here, none of us will ever talk to you again. And that means that you've been taken by Satan. Yes. Other faith-based weight loss programs also find it problematic. Director of First Place, Carol Lewis, expressed her concerns, telling the New York Times, You don't want the child to feel punished because they're overweight. The problem usually comes from within the family. Shamblin takes the criticism in stride, claiming that, These kids have bright eyes and a different lease on life. They don't focus on the self anymore, and it is a beautiful thing. They absolutely focus on the self. The opposite, yeah. That's all they do focus on now because Mm -hmm. they're constantly thinking, am I good enough for God? Have I, am I eating too much? Is is he going to be mad? Am I, you know, I mean, it's, you have taken what they probably didn't really think about that much, but then Mm -hmm. their parents get involved in this. And then, because that Nicholas Zanoni, the article was he attends the meetings in the church with his parents and other siblings. So, you know, an 11-year-old doesn't know to sign up for this. The parents sign them up. He, You know, they wouldn't even think it was a problem unless their parents told them it was. True. And I will also say, uh, I don't know that it's funny, but the interesting little fact is that one the former member who left that kind of wrote the rundown of it said that the preaching part of the Remnant Fellowship did not have like a kid's version. Like when I was a kid, I went to vacation Bible school and it's like a week long and you go and there's like crafts and you learn about Jesus. And like, I don't know, it's like pretty smart child development to direct lessons to the learning style of a person's brain, depending on if they're eight years old or 28 years old. And apparently he said that she mocked other churches for having kids-based religious you know, sessions and that they had to just come to the regular preaching where she was going to preach and that the kids were be really bored or they would be reading or falling asleep because there wasn't a Sunday school. There wasn't something for them to do that would be more focused and directed at them. So I find it kind of, I won't say ironic, but suspicious that while there's not a specific religious lecture for the children, that there's a specific weight loss program Mm. for the children. So it's like, what are we really focusing on is, are we here because we want them to be closer to God or be here because we want them to lose weight and probably pay for the program to lose weight? Absolutely. Yes. They're paying for all these programs. Even if they're at the church, they're still paying for all of these programs. Oh, yeah. Because Christy, they have to go on and help the next person. That's true. Yes. 
Okay, this is the next part and the, that we're going to talk about is involving child abuse and the death of a child. In addition to weight loss, the church preaches child obedience. In an audio recording obtained by News Channel 5, Shamlin stated, If your children are not scared of a spanking, you haven't spanked them. If you haven't really spanked them yet, you don't love them. You love yourself. Former members said Gwen instructed that the children had to feel the pain. We'll also talk about this News Channel 5 again. Man, there's a reporter on there that really does not hold back. And he interviews her and says, did you say these things? And she's like, no, I did not. And he's like, anyway, here's a recording repeatedly. So I don't know if she just talks off the top of her head and doesn't think about it or if she's embarrassed that she says you should really beat your kids. And if you don't, you don't love them. What did she say when he called her out and played it back? And she's like, well, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's just. It's talked like, in again, circles. Talked yeah. in circles. Yeah. It doesn't mm-hmm. say, OK, yeah, you're right. I did say that. Um, I am a hundred thousand percent against spanking. There are so many studies that prove the damage of it. And that while one may think that it is, um, helping their child be more obedient and disciplined, it actually does the complete opposite. Not to mention you're teaching your child that if they do something wrong, you're going to physically hurt them, which so I have a question. call me you're... crazy, but that's not the best, uh, lesson that we want to learn no not at all and i have a question for you as a parent because i'm not a parent uh, how often and it can be daily weekly monthly how often do you slap your child with a glue stick like a long hot glue stick like a clear long glue stick uh, zero times oh my goodness well that's weird because everybody in this church beat the shit out of their kids with glue sticks i won't say everybody but a good chunk a good number to the point that she was like well we never told him to do that it was just something that the members all did because it was a way for you to hit your kid and it wouldn't leave a mark is what they said in the interviews. Because of the material of it? Yeah, I guess because you could slap them with glue sticks. And wow. when I first initially heard hit them with glue sticks, I thought like an Elmer's glue. A tiny one. You'd- a oh, tiny yeah. one, maybe like in a bag or something, which I thought actually would probably hurt more. But it's these, I saw in the news article, it's like longer than an ink pen, a little bit thicker, yeah. clear glue stick that goes in a hot glue gun that I guess you just whack and you're supposed to like whack them with it. Um for obedience purposes. Yeah. No. Nope. So that they can feel the pain. Definitely would not do that. And as everybody knows, we typically don't cover cases that involve kids. This was kind of one thing that happened within a, a, a bigger picture. And it's a terrible, horrible thing. But that's why we decided not only to include it because it's critical to the story, but why we would do this topic. In 2003, two church members Joseph and Sonia Smith were arrested and charged with felony murder, aggravated assault, cruelty to children, and false imprisonment for abuse they inflicted on their eight-year-old son, Joseph, that resulted in his death. The medical examiner determined that Joseph's cause of death was acute and chronic abuse, according to Court TV. The couple spent just four months in pretrial detention until the church posted their bond. The church's headquarters were raided in connection with the child's death but no one at the church was charged, according to the Associated Press. After their trial in 2007, Joseph's parents were convicted and sentenced to life plus 30 years in prison, the maximum punishment. All subsequent appeals have been denied. The church responded through one of its leaders in a statement to Fox News, saying, We will continue to support the Smith family in any way we can. Shamblin claimed she had nothing to do with the crime, telling the New York Times, I can't be responsible for what goes on elsewhere. Admitting, however, that she did give the accused parents funds for their defense. Not only that, she, on a recorded line, uh, it was like, a, I guess, a radio show, gave Mrs. Smith instructions and confirmed that what they were doing was great. When Sonia Smith says, oh, we took everything out of his room and every single piece of furniture out of his room and we locked him in there with just his Bible from Friday until Monday, Mm -hmm. which is torture. You're torturing your child that she admits on the recorded line. And Gwen Shamlin's like, that's exactly what we told you to do. Great work. Great work. Yeah, she says... You're going to have a a wild, crazy kid go to an obedient kid, and that's just miraculous. Because you fucking tortured him. So, yeah, not to get too much into any of the details, but the judge gave them the maximum sentence, which is life plus 30, because the judge said this is one of the most egregious cases of child abuse that I have seen on the bench. And the amount of witnesses and the whole trial was covered on, um, you know, they had 
it wasn't aired on court TV, but it was covered by the reporters and very difficult stuff to read. But the fact that you're like, well, we, you know, I mean, and I, I guess if you want to say the, that it's like, I, again, the irony of saying, well, we totally love and support them no matter what. So they'll love and support you if you beat your children to the point that they actually die. But if you are overweight, that is conditional and God doesn't love you. Right. And to also say, well, I can't be responsible for what goes on elsewhere. When you egg Yet them on on the phone? you And you're giving them money for their defense and posting their bond? So, yeah. I mean, you're, maybe you're, that's not like admitting responsibility, but it sure as shit is saying what you did wasn't wrong and what we taught you that in turn influenced you to do this to your child isn't wrong. So, ipso facto... You are responsible. Well, so and you're people, culpable. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you need to go to jail for it, but I think you f- morally are responsible for at least encouraging the practice and not saying, whoa, 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 I didn't tell you to lock somebody up with nothing for three days with no food and water. I would never say that. It's like, well, there you go. That's mm-hmm. what we told you to do. Great work, great work. And other parents expressed concern, and some left the church because they said, they, they're like, well, I'm not going to spank my kid or like if I discipline them, it's going to be at home. And that if the kid would act up, that other church members would spank their kids mm-hmm. for them. Like, that's the quickest way oh. for you to get your ass beat oh, is to hit dude. somebody else's kid. That is crazy to me. But they said, oh, no, we were like, oh, we got to get out of here because the kids would be like, oh, I'm scared that guy spanked me the other day. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. One ex member said that they told her to spank her four year old's bare bottom for an hour straight. Mm. And that the 11 year old in was was spanked with a paddle by other members. And that's when she GTFO'd. Yeah, because, again, you it's like drawing someone in. It's like any cult. You break them down. You tell them this is the only way that you're going to be saved. This is the only way your kid's going to be saved. And then you see all this harm done to your kids. And like, God bless them for having the strength to be like, hell no, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in all the videos of these weird ass videos of Gwen and her family and all these, the wedding video, the engagement video. It is bizarre. There are so many children running around that Mm -hmm. you just look at them and think what you must be going through. Not only the just disgusting messages that are being fed to you about your looks and your weight and how you have to be perfect and how you'll never be accepted if you're not, not only by Mm -hmm. other people, but by God, but that you're also being physically abused. You're being Mm -hmm. physically and emotionally abused day in and day out. Yeah. Yeah. On top of all of it. In 2018, Gwen divorced her husband of 40 years, David Shamblin. She then married Joe Lara, an actor known for his role on Tarzi and the Epic Adventures, in a wedding ceremony attended by over 1,500 people. The new power couple was worshipped by their congregation. While members continued to flock to Remnant Fellowship and subscribe to the Way Down Methods, some in the church began to question if the practices were in fact godly or more similar to that of a cult. Soon, they would learn the repercussions of having such questions and, daring to doubt, Gwen Shamblin Lara. I could not find anywhere how Joe Lara and her met. I couldn't either. I'll look, we'll look. We'll do a little bit more digging. Or if you all, if somebody's in the Brentwood area and you happen to know the the hot deets, well, I I don't. I will confess I didn't look very hard. I looked moderately hard. I looked more for how her and David met, and then also how her and Joe met because it wasn't. It seemed very like she got divorced after 40 years and then pretty quickly got married again. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming he was a member of the church or the program or or they connected somehow through that. But I don't know. So if somebody knows, send us send us an article. Let us let us know. Holler at us. Uh, I was mostly like hypnotoed in trance by the YouTube video. So Mm. (laughs) deep into that. Man, if you want to just have your jaw on the floor for a good eight minutes check out the engagement proposal take a journey take a from journey. joe to gwen which i they presented as if it's supposed to be a surprise but there's a full-on camera crew 
they're dressed. He's in a tuxedo. There's lights everywhere. It's all so staged. And then after the engagement, there's a fireworks show. And all of the congregation are also dressed in former wear. And then a huge party occurs. It's which if I had to relook at the title of the video because I was like, oh, this must be their wedding because that's no, what it looked like. And I was like, no, this is the engagement. Like. How did you, what did you think was happening when, that when you set all of this up, it's so, Boy. it's so wild, just the constantly behaving as if you're being watched, as if you're playing to a camera, you know, I mean, it's, you're, you're on all the time because essentially you are, you are mm -hmm. constantly playing this role that you've created to your congregation to your followers it's, also, it's very decadent it's just very very yes and excess. then you're like but i take no salary but yes, here's my mansion and we're all in tuxedos and ball gowns and there's a million dollars worth of flowers and food set out that nobody's gonna eat i couldn't figure out if the fireworks were real or cgi imposed oh well there's if they lot. were there she she does a great job of fake reacting to them because they um, straight up react to all those fake fireworks if those are CGI. Well, I think there's probably some fireworks, but I think they're enhanced. One of the best oh. parts of watching the, again, hours and hours of footage of this was of self-produced footage was Paris kind of he I mean, much like he does when I'm watching Real Housewives, he's kind of in the background, just kind of like, what are you watching? You know, trying to entertain himself while I'm like, hang on, I got to watch this weight loss, this weight loss for Jesus video. And he just goes. How how did they publish this to thousands of people? Like the quality and it and it is a lot of times the video quality of some of the I'm gonna just talk to you in my kitchen, you can't hear, the audio is totally off, um, the music. Anyway, it's it, yeah. It's it's a lot for as decadent as the engagement is, there's it's like where where's this money going? Well, a very decadent engagement and like not awesome production um <laughs> right. in some of the other videos. But it's um Definitely. So, if we're at, so, what do we think? Not to jump mm -hmm. ahead, but no, I think I think we are too. So, we've, what, do we what think? did we think from from moment one? And I think we'll have even more in in part two. But I mean, so far, when we very first were suggested this topic, and uh, you know, we'll we'll bring it to its conclusion in the next episode. I thought, well, I don't know if the, you know, there's a ton there. And then when you start digging into it, it really is kind of uh, a multifaceted. Uh, mirror on all the things that uh, societally what we do to punish ourselves and one another, you know, of like telling people they're not good enough. God doesn't love them. They're not one of God's children unless they're thin, pushing thin, you know, pushing that even if you're thin, you're not thin enough, um, that you got to wait till your stomach's growling, that there's only one way to God. And it's through this one single person uh, taking advantage of people who are vulnerable pushing this idea of physical torture on kids as a way somehow to make them morally better. I was like, oh, no, there's a, there's a lot here. There's a whole shitload of stuff And here. if you just listen to everything you just listed, it's every reprehensible thing someone does just yeah. in one, wrapped up into one big-haired woman. Yeah, and and again, too, like what, what happened to anybody in her life to say hey what are you doing stop doing this and then like it's like with Allison Mack and Keith Raniere of yeah you're a victim because you were raised into this but then you're going on to perpetuate the mm -hmm. same you're the one that's in charge of doing that to kids of mm -hmm. to telling kids that they need to lose 10 more pounds and you know at what point do you step over the line from victim to now being fully complicit and a participant in it so and all of her children live they all live right seriously like righteous gemstones next door to each other in this the same little million dollar homes and they see the website says they see each other all the time you know they talk they all, on the phone multiple times they a day, have yeah. all have grandchildren so they're all and they all the the children and the children's spouses work for the church and mm -hmm. are very involved in the church so it's i mean everyone is just completely indoctrinated into this and you know obviously they're going to raise their children the same way and then either it keeps going keeps going or somebody breaks a cycle at some point mm -hmm. but it's a it's not only just being raised in a cult from the perspective of religion but it's being raised in the cult of diet culture and mm -hmm body shaming and disordered eating and eating disorders. And it's just, my heart breaks for the kids that are having to be involved in this. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot more. There's a lot more we got to cover too. Yep, we got part two where we're like you said, talk about a lot more testimonials and um, elements that make it cultish. Yep, and then uh, some other stuff too. So we will get to that next week. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, a special shout out on the show, a monthly bonus mini and patron exclusive video and audio content, including uh, we've get, been getting rave reviews from Judge Christie recently. It Aww. was very funny. This last <laughs> we, one was. We got tickled. Dude, I haven't laughed that hard in a while. Like a <laughs> genuine surprise laugh of something being revealed to me that made me just cry laugh. <laughs> It was very fun. Um, and as well as our Am I the Asshole relationship advice and Dear Sinister, where you can send in your uh, relationship and uh, life advice questions for yes. us. Yes. You also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We'll also be hopping on occasionally and hosting monthly Q&As, where you can ask us all your burning questions. For patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. And if you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top banner. Also, keep your eyes peeled on social media, and we are going to be announcing the uh, launch of our new store super soon. So we'll do it on the air, but like the second it goes live, we'll also um, do it on our social media so you can be the first to get some dope stuff, including stickers and all kinds of and water bottles, yes. things you've never had before. So yes. it's all new. And now we've been plugging it for a while but it's almost finished <laughs> this is a, this is what happens when two people run a whole entire business so we yes. got we got to triage our priorities yeah, well, so. we do the best thing you can do to help us grow is like review and subscribe on apple podcast or wherever you listen to your podcast and please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out it means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure you can know when the show merch website's going to launch as well as get all kinds of updates on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at? I'm on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I am on Instagram at Heather vs. The World and on Twitter at MCK vs. The World. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Brittany Yock. Leah. Holly Sutherland. Sarai Piguro. Sarah Call. Amy Gibb. Charlene Egan. Sammy Burke. Rosalinda Hernandez. Catherine Pointer. Stacey Watson. Hannah Anderson. Okay, lady. Justice Hammers. Nice. Rachel Crump. Michelle. Bailey Schaefer. Lena Benoit. Megan Allenan, Georgia Kalura, Alexandra Goldener, Mandolin Yazzie, Sharon Banks, Chris, Jessica Mann, Carly Jerome, Ashley Roach, Gentle Waters, Shenanigan the She Devil, Haley Ryan, Jay, Lisa, Heather, not me. What's up, <laughs> other Heather? <laughs> Olivia Calabresi, Clara Davenport, L. Kern. Miranda Morrison, Nadia Danica Bunyaman, Mackenzie Cope, Kylie, Tui, Kate Spade, Aaron Kelly, Catherine Judd, Ashley Bacchus, Amanda Griswold, KB, Megan Williams, Auntie Philomena, Dominga Selman, Jennifer Powell, and Rachel Richardson. Thank you so much, guys, for supporting the Patreon. We could not do this without you. We sincerely appreciate it. We hope we got your names right. 
Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Mwahaha. <laughs> Sinister.